Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of In the Fighting Chair. Uh, my name is Keith Cowley. I'm the curator of Living Sharks Museum. Uh, this is our little project here. Uh, we're repurposing the fighting chair to talk about uh, shark related issues, shark history and conservation. And we've been very, very fortunate to have some amazing guests on this show. I really appreciate everyone who's been watching and supporting. Uh, I've been getting a lot of great comments uh, and a lot of great suggestions uh, for future shows. So I re really appreciate that interaction. Uh, today, I'm, I'm very honored and, and humbled in many ways uh, to have uh, Peter Hammerstedt here today to talk with us. Um, he is the captain of the Bob Barker with Sea Shepherd. Uh, he's got amazing stories to share with us and a lot of experience. And it's great to be able to chat with folks who have boots on the ground in a lot of these issues. But I, I want to talk a little bit about how he got his start and what inspired him. So I'm going to bring Peter on now without further ado. Hey, Keith. Hello, Peter. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks for having me in the fighting chair. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we won't be fighting today. I think we agree on, on just about everything that's going to be presented. It's very important information, uh, very important work that you're doing. Uh, very grateful. There may be some folks watching uh, now or later who are not that familiar with what you do, uh, maybe not that familiar with the Sea Shepherd, but we'll get to that. I'd like to talk a little bit about you, if you don't mind. Where are you originally from, Peter? So I'm Swedish American. I actually grew up on the East Coast in a little town called New Hope, Pennsylvania. I joined Sea Shepherd when I was 18 years old. I was 14 years old when I saw a picture of a dead minke whale being pulled up the slipway of an 8,000 ton factory whaling ship down in the Antarctic. And that, that image just shocked me to the core. And I just could not believe that whaling was still happening in, in modern time. I thought like many people that whaling had ended in the, the 70s and 80s with the Save the Whales movement. And so to, to discover that not only was it happening, but it was happening in a designated whale sanctuary, I knew that I had to get involved. So I submitted my application as soon as I was old enough to join. That was 18. And I've been sailing the seven seas with Sea Shepherd ever since. That's going on 17 years now. That's incredible. Now, before your time uh, with Sea Shepherd, did you have any other influences uh, that, uh, that made you think that you were definitely going to work in the world of marine conservation? I mean, I, I wasn't in a family where we spent a lot of time on, on the seaside, but my, my parents were very influential in having me read as much as I could about as many subjects as possible. And that's how I really started hearing about whaling. And whaling became sort of the portal for me to enter the conservation movement. I think in a lot of cases, whales are, are symbolic of a lot of the greater threats that face the marine environment. And in the same way that we had a Save the Whales movement in the 70s, 80s and coming into now, we really need to Save the Sharks movement now. So for, for me, whales was what I was passionate about when I was 14. And then that made me passionate about everything that revolves around the oceans. I appreciate you saying that uh, we need a shark, uh, Save the Sharks movement now. Uh, I think it's definitely in motion. Uh, but actually, one of your first campaigns with Sea Shepherd was in the Galapagos, if I'm correct, and you got an opportunity to have some impact on, on shark conservation. You're right. I, I originally joined to go to Iceland to stop whaling there, but we had mechanical delays that kept us grounded in Seattle. And when we were finally able to get underway, the whaling season was over in the North Atlantic, and we found ourselves in the Galapagos Marine Reserve. And after five, six months of getting the ship ready in, in the port of Seattle, I remember us coming across an illegal long line that had been set to catch sharks for their fins. And the first action that I ever participated with with Sea Shepherd was working together with the crew to pull that long line out of the water. And I remember it was about eight miles long, sporting thousands of hooks, and we worked eight hours to, to pull that line out of the water. And I could cut these hooks off this line and, and, and hold them in my hand and realize that this one hook wasn't going to kill a shark or a sea turtle or an albatross 
or any living creature. And the only thing that stood between life and death for these creatures was passionate and compassionate people taking direct action to pull that line out of the water. Now, for the folks that are watching that may not be that familiar uh, with Sea Shepherd, could you tell us a little bit about uh, what they do? Uh, sea Shepherd is an international marine conservation organization. Uh, we believe that where there are law enforcement vacuums, there somebody needs to fill that law enforcement void. We have a lot of the laws and regulations in place to protect marine wildlife and to pre protect marine habitats. But what is lacking is law enforcement. And so what we do is we take direct action when governments lack either the political will or the economic means or sometimes even the jurisdiction to protect marine wildlife. And we measure our success by the number of lives that we save and by the number of criminal operations that we shut down. And recently, our main push has been working together with developing island and coastal states around the continent of Africa, working with the Coast Guard, with the navies of these countries to patrol against illegal fishing. Now, in the Galapagos, you, you had an opportunity to work hands-on with the, with the long lines. In other parts of the world, you don't really have that kind of access. Uh, in Australia, for instance, uh, like you couldn't really get close to the lines to do any work. Is that true? Well, there's been a case of drum lines and shark nets being set up in Queensland and in Western Australia. These methods are lethal to sharks and they don't really provide any swimmer safety whatsoever. And so we've been advocating across Australia for shark spotter programs and other non-lethal methods of protecting uh, swimmers from sharks. And I, I think what shows the absurdity of this drumline strategy is if you look at the annual Rothnest Island swim that happens from Perth to a small island off the coast of Western Australia, they actually remove the drumlines during the swim because the drumlines actually attract sharks. And what we're finding on these lines are, are sharks and uh, even dolphins and, and, and whales as well are being caught up in this, in this gear. And so we, we've been working to expose that now for many years. So you spend much of your life at sea, it could be said. Can you tell us a little bit about the state of the oceans through your eyes? Certainly we're experiencing what is called the sixth great extinction in, in ecological history. It's the, the sixth in a line of five mass extinctions that preceded it. And it's the first that's really been caused by, by us. If you look at the state of the world's oceans, then the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization say that 90% of the world's fisheries are either fully exploited or overexploited. Uh, we're looking at illegal fishing being a big component of the overfishing issue, where in some places up to 40 or 50% of the catch of fish is caught illegally, where globally one out of five fish is caught illegally. And if you look at shark populations in the Atlantic, many species of sharks have fallen by 90 percent in just the past 50 years so we are we are really at a critical state and that's why we have to band together and identify critical areas of biodiversity biodiversity where we can take a stand and and help these marine environments regain their resilience and biodiversity now a lot of people know that Sea Shepherd is more often associated with chasing Japanese whaling vessels in the Antarctic but presently a big focus appears to be on the illegal fishing. How did this come about? And how are you working to stop poaching of marine wildlife off the coast of Africa in particular? Well, after 10 years of chasing Japanese whaling ships around the Antarctic, uh, we were successful in getting Australia and New Zealand to take the government of Japan to the International Court of Justice in The Hague, the highest court in the world. And the International Court of Justice found that their whaling program in the Antarctic was illegal. And that created then a one year hiatus when the Japanese whaling fleet did not head down to the Southern Ocean. Uh, during that time, we were able to focus on a different poaching problem in the Antarctic, namely the poaching of Antarctic and Patagonian toothfish. There were six vessels that we came to call the Bandit Six that had been operating down there for over 10 years. One of those vessels, a, an Interpol wanted internationally blacklisted ship called the Thunder, had been making an illicit profit of $60 million in, in their 10 year poaching career in the Antarctic. 
Uh, and we came up with a campaign to shut them down. We, we chased this ship for 110 days across three oceans and 11,000 miles from the Antarctic to the Gulf of Guinea in West Africa. And because the captain of this poaching vessel couldn't shake our pursuit, the captain ultimately sank his own ship in an ill-fated bid to destroy the evidence on board. We rescued his crew, uh, the captain was brought to justice, and ultimately we helped shut down illegal fishing in, in the Antarctic. But seeing them sink their own ship in the Gulf of Guinea highlighted a major issue off the coast of West Africa, which is inadequate monitoring control and surveillance. And uh, we then started partnering with countries, countries that have navies and coast guards, but maybe don't necessarily have the vessel assets, the ships, to cover the entirety of their waters. Uh, we have agreements now in place with seven countries around the African continent, from the Gambia to Benin to Liberia, Sao Tome and Principe, Gabon, Namibia and Tanzania, whereby we provide the ship, the operating crew and the fuel, and our partner countries provide the law enforcement agents with the authority to board, inspect, and arrest ships. And working together with those countries, we've assisted those countries to arrest 52 vessels for illegal fishing and other fisheries crimes, including shark finning. Now you were just in Liberia with Eli Roth. Is that some of the work you were doing there with him? That's right. The, the, the director, Eli Roth, uh, famed horror movie director from Los Angeles, actually accompanied uh, me to Liberia to see uh, one of these illegal slaughterhouses for himself, a vessel that had been arrested by the Liberian Coast Guard, supported by us. It was a ship called the Labico II. Uh, when the Sea Shepherd ship Sam Simon came across this vessel fishing in Liberian waters, they knew that it was legally licensed to fish there for tuna uh, using long lines. But once on board, they discovered that there wasn't a single tuna on board. This, this ship was using deep sea gill nets to take deep sea sharks for the production of shark liver oil. Uh, we discovered that this vessel was previously known under the name of Maine, a vessel that was on three international blacklists, that in the 1990s, it was part of a fleet of 50 ships that were largely Spanish owned, that targeted deep sea sharks in the Atlantic. These 50 vessels were so effective that in just three years, the population of deep sea sharks in the North Atlantic fell by, by 80%. And they were so effective at targeting deep sea sharks that the European Union kicked these vessels out. Each uh, vessel would, uh, the amount of line they would put out or the amount of net they would put out would, ex in any one night, would extend from Los Angeles to New York and back again. Just incredible lengths of, of net. And in any single given um, month, they would lose about 30 kilometers of this gill net to become ghost net that would just drift and drift and kill and kill. And that is the equivalent of about 750 tons of marine plastic in the form of gill nets. Incredibly destructive. Once they were kicked out of the European Union, they, uh, they went to off the coast of India where they wiped out deep sea sharks. They then moved to the Mozambique Channel where they wiped out deep sea sharks. And the discovery of this vessel operating off the coast of Liberia meant that they'd found their way to West Africa. The Liberian Coast Guard on board discovered uh, cargo manifests that showed that every three weeks the vessel was offloading 50 tons of shark liver oil onshore. And to produce 50 tons of shark liver oil takes the lives of about 66,000 deep sea sharks. So that means that this one single vessel was killing over half a million sharks every single year illegally to produce shark liver oil. And that just blows my mind. As, as shark conservationists, we know that 73 to 100 million sharks are killed every single year. Well, here's just one vessel that nobody knew about that was taking half a million every year. The vessel was arrested. Um, it hasn't fished since then. And that means that this one single action by the Liberian Coast Guard, supported by Sea Shepherd, has saved the lives of over 1 million sharks and counting. And those are the kinds of successes that Sea Shepherd is able to deliver. 
you bring up a really good point about effectiveness. And that's one of the major differences in the world of commercial fishing, uh, even recreational fishing nowadays, uh, is that the technology has changed. Uh, it, here in the museum, actually, I have an invoice uh, from Peru uh, from 1873 for shark liver oil, believe it or not. Wow. Uh, but uh, for uh, just under 900 uh, gallons. Uh, which is seems very very significant even for its time but I mean, you're talking mm -hmm. about the uh, in tons uh it's it's just mind-blowing and, and uh, absolutely terrible uh, but you you talk about effectiveness and that is seems to be what's changed and the technology is advanced and we're able to catch more and more fish more and more sharks we're doing it so effectively that it's happening so quickly well, it, in many ways, it's the militarization of industrial fishing. All these military technologies, or what were what were invented as military technologies, like GPS and sonar, are being used by fishing vessels that now are able to stay out longer. They're able to go out further, and they're able to use technologies that marine wildlife cannot hide from. There's no getting away from them. Now, have you come across any shark finning activity in this time period? You've been with Sea Shepherd. We have. Uh, there was a vessel that was arrested by the Tanzanian police service off the coast of East Africa. We were working with them there. Uh, this vessel, when it was boarded, the Tanzanian police discovered that they were finning sharks. They also discovered a loaded Beretta pistol in the cabin of, of the captain, who was a Taiwanese national. The Taiwanese captain was routinely using this gun to threaten the Indonesian crew on board, according to their accounts to the police. Uh, they would be told that they would be shot if they weren't catching enough fish and they weren't given food and they weren't given water unless they were catching sharks as well. The vessel was arrested by the Tanzanian Navy. It was prosecuted in Tanzania and actually the captain, the owner and the agent were all sentenced to prison for 20 years in Tanzania, which is, I think, probably the, the toughest punishment I've ever heard of for any person engaged in shark finning. And it certainly sends a strong message that shark finning isn't tolerated in the waters of Tanzania. Uh, earlier this year, uh, I was in the Gambia uh, with, with one of our vessels. Uh, we came across the ship there. We're on the monkey deck, the upper deck of the ship. Uh, the, sh the crew were drying 54 fins that were either from sharks or rays, most likely guitar fish. And that vessel was arrested by the Gambian authorities as shark finning is not allowed in the waters of the Gambia in West Africa. So, so we, do, we do come across it. And in all the cases where it's been discovered, our, our partners' countries have have taken decisive action, and that's been really inspiring. It's a very difficult thing to to uh, discover, uh, since uh, for those folks uh, who are watching that don't know much about shark finning, uh, just just the general concept, and that these fins are removed from these sharks, and the sharks are typically dumped overboard, uh, alive, uh, in most cases, uh, and, it's, and it's a lot easier to stow away and hide that kind of product, especially when you come back to port, especially if you're changing the name of your ship and your flags and all these other factors that make you invisible. Um, you clearly know that what you're doing is illegal. Um, yeah. it's, it's disheartening. Uh, amazing to hear these uh, success stories, by the way. Uh, are there any other uh, threats to sharks that you've come across? I see one of the biggest threats is is bycatch in the industrial fishing sector. And uh, people know about the big push for dolphin safe tuna in, in the United States in, in the 80s, uh, which was successful in many ways. And yet uh, t dolphins are still being killed in tuna nets. But the, the number of dolphins that are being killed has been reduced as the United States won't import tuna that's been caught by vessels that deliberately set their nets on dolphin pods, which was leading to this entanglement issue. Uh, but what, what pursainers are doing now is they're setting their nets on fish fishing aggregation, fish aggregation devices or FADs, which are essentially like fish magnets. Uh, tuna are attracted to floating objects at sea. And so these FADs are put out sometimes by the hundreds or thousands by fishing vessels. They have sonar and satellite technology that can report to these ships when fish start congregating around them. And because they predominantly attract juvenile fish, they also attract sharks that are also migratory. 
So we've seen a big, big problem with shark bycatch. And from the industrial fishing vessels that I've boarded in the Gulf of Guinea, it's common that with every single set that's been made to fish for tuna, every fishing activity, there's on average between 10 or, or 20 sharks that are also pulled up with that tuna. And about 90% of those sharks eventually die. Even if they're even if they're brought on board alive, they simply won't survive uh, release because they've been compacted in the net. They've been manhandled on deck. Uh, they've been stressed and panicked, and therefore their chances of survival are very low. So if, if you're buying canned tuna, you, you are actually quite directly contributing to the deaths of sharks. And it's something that I think most people don't know about. We need to have shark safe tuna and, and that just doesn't exist. And there's a, a large size discrepancy too over the years with, when we look at fishing uh, historically. Uh, you've given some examples in, in other interviews about uh, how tuna in particular uh, have been considerably larger than what we're catching today. Uh, a lot of it having to do with just that over harvest um, and just these fish not having a chance. In the Mediterranean, they, they used to catch bluefin tuna that were six meters long. I mean, that's that's unfathomable today uh, to see a bluefin tuna that's six meters in length. Now, uh, the biggest bluefin tuna that you'd catch that would be maybe about two and a half meters. And a two and a half meter bluefin tuna, as rare as it is, will, will fetch for about a quarter of a million dollars on the Tokyo fish market. So it, it's... It's incredible. There is that that theory of shifting baseline. We we don't fully comprehend how bountiful the seas were, looking back a hundred years or two hundred years even or even further. Um, we're, we we've gotten used to and we've adapted to the oceans in their diminished state. And what we look at as being a lot of marine wildlife today is is just a fraction of what once existed. Of course, we're seeing that in the shark communities uh, here on the east coast of the United States as we're trying to set population uh, uh, limits, I should say, uh, set limits for fishing. Uh, it's some of these, like the grander makos, we're not seeing anymore, and we don't know if it's because they have been overfished, which we're assuming it is, or whether or not you know they're migrating further out to sea where we just don't have those uh, population, uh, that population data. Um, but it's it's a very sad state of affairs all over the world. Mm. What, what's it's your been, next was, oh, So what we're hoping to do is, is is expand on the successes that we have to date, working with these countries in West Africa. We're hoping that what what we've discovered is that when working with these countries, we can el eliminate illegal fishing in the areas that we're doing these joint at sea patrols. But we have to ensure that the poaching problem isn't just moving to a neighboring country. So if we can sign agreements with the countries that neighbor our existing partners, then we can start doing regional patrols, and, and that would be ideal. Uh, with COVID-19, uh, travel is, is a lot more difficult. Uh, our ships are currently self-quarantining, and our crews on board are self-quarantining, but we're, we're working towards getting back out on patrol off the coast of West Africa as soon as it's safe to, to do so. And what can the people watching do to help support the Sea Shepherd? People can go onto our website, seashepherd.org. Uh, there they can donate. All of our campaigns are made possible through donations from the public, uh, predominantly our, our monthly donors. So if people want to see the types of successes like what we were able to achieve with the arrest of the Labico 2, an action that has saved the lives of a million sharks and counting, then they can they can donate to Sea Shepherd by going on to seashepherd.org and we will do our utmost to translate those generous donations into sharks saved at sea. Also, most of our crew are volunteers. So uh, if you have time to spare and want to get directly involved on the deck of one of our ships or in the engine rooms of one of our ships or in the galleys of one of our ships, then uh, you can download a, a volunteer or accruing application on there. And we also have onshore volunteers who do outreach and fundraising uh, to, to support the crews at sea. Awesome. Are, are there any other ways that you could uh, advise our uh, audience to help protect sharks, help support shark research and conservation? 
I think now is a really important time with COVID-19 where a lot of people are staying home to, to read as much as they can about these issues. I think we have the obligation to go back into the fight for the protection of sharks uh, more educated than before COVID-19 started. And so hope and, and to also form forms coalitions and and help broaden the shark community so that we have that strength in numbers. That's a good point. There are a lot of organizations that are already out there existing, you know, fighting the good fight, uh, your organization included. Uh, so definitely uh, to our audience out there, there, there are organizations you can support in a lot of different ways, but familiarizing yourself uh, with what is out there, what people are doing, uh, to learn what you can do, uh, what the issues really are. There's a lot of great resources out there, even on the Sea Shepherd website, uh, just learning some of the encounters and what the issues actually are currently and what you might be able to do about it. Peter, I thank you for all this information. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add? Uh, I, I just want to say thank you so much for having me on the show. It's a, it's an honor to 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 join you all for for this for this chat and. Uh, I hope to visit the Living Sharks Museum in person on the other side of COVID-19. I would love to see you here. Uh, it's great to chat with you, Peter, and I thank you so much for joining us on In the Fighting Chair, and hopefully we'll get to have you on again in the future and see where things are going. That would be great. Thank you so much, Keith. Right, have a great day. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the conclusion of our interview with Peter Hammerstedt. Uh, the Sea Shepherd. He's the captain of the Bob Barker. Uh, please visit uh, seashepherd.org and see uh, a little bit more information on what these campaigns are and what they're doing uh, to protect sharks. And I appreciate everyone who supported this project in the fighting chair. has been a lot of fun. Uh, even when the museum opens back up, we look forward to continuing this interview series because it's just been a great experience, uh, I think, for everyone. Uh, please keep an eye on our website, livingsharks.org, to learn uh, a little bit more about when we are opening up and when you can have access to our research collections. And follow us on social media, of course, and keep an eye out for our next guest on In the Fighting Chair. Thanks so much for watching. <laughs>